Thank you, Michael. President Schlimpert, President Custer, Dean Silak, and all friends. Well, whenever anybody introduces me as a member of the Highwaymen, I always tell this story. Years ago, when I was working for the Department of Justice in the Criminal Division, because I grew up in Mexico and speak Spanish, I was frequently sent down to Central America to talk to police chiefs. So I showed up down there, and the gentleman who was introducing me spoke English reasonably well, but I was being introduced in Spanish, and he had my CV, and he was going through it. And when he got to the bottom, just as Michael just did, he looked at it and told the assembled police chiefs that before I went to law school, I'd been an armed robber. <laughs> I did nothing to try to abuse them of that notion. <laughs> Leaders for the transformation of society. What a great mission. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. And black history feeds into this quite well. So let's get right at it. I'm going to talk about a man who was a leader and who transformed society in a way that benefits all of us, not just his own people. Now, our nation began with a vision a vision that all of us are created equal, endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure those rights, we held that governments are instituted by us, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. But that grand vision of equal protection and equal standing before the law failed to make it into our Constitution. It finally did, but it took 80 years, a civil war, the deaths of 623,000 American soldiers before the 14th Amendment and its Equal Protection Clause finally made its way into the law. But 28 years later, the Supreme Court of the United States canceled equal protection of the law for black American citizens in a case called Plessy versus Ferguson, a disgraceful decision if there ever was one. Now, who was Homer Plessy? Homer Plessy was simply a black man who lived in Louisiana, and he had the misfortune of deciding that he ought to be able to ride in a whites-only passenger railroad car, even though he was black. He thought the 14th Amendment's equal protection guarantee would allow him to do that. Well, Homer Plessy got onto the car, whites only, was arrested, convicted, and fined $25. He fought his case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, as you might imagine. But when he got to the Supreme Court, the court said that the Equal Protection Clause certainly did not contemplate the commingling of the races. And the, and the justices sent Homer and his race back to the coloreds only car in Louisiana. That decision, one of the most reviled in the history of American courts, that, that decision alone ushered in the era of legal se separation, segregation by race, and of the deliberate exclusion of black citizens from the American dream. The disgraceful era of Jim Crow and the ugly lie of separate but equal. 1896 was a bad year for civil rights in the United States. Now, one man, one man conceived of, started, and engineered the legal campaign to overturn Plessy and to shatter the malevolent meaning given to the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment by the Supreme Court. One man, one man set out by himself on a long, sometimes arduous, and lonely journey on the behalf of his people to try to realize the American dream, training and gathering supporters along the way as he went. His name was Charles Hamilton Houston. He was a true leader in the law for the transformation of society. And his life illustrates how to use the law to change society for the benefit of all of us. Charlie, as his friends called him, was born in Washington, D.C. in 1895, just one year before Plessy versus Ferguson. He had the very good fortune of growing up in an intact family. His mother was a teacher. His father was a lawyer. They both served the black community in their area. He went to Amherst College in Massachusetts, graduating in 1915 at the top of his class. Typical young kid, no particular plans for activism, smart, obviously, doing well, entire life in front of him, but World War I had just broken out in Europe. 
1915. So what did Charlie do? He volunteered for the armed forces. And because of his sterling background and record, he soon found himself as an officer in a black segregated unit in the American army in Europe. Now, after he survived the experience, Charlie told anybody who cared to listen that during his time in the American army, he felt that he was in more, he was in more danger from white racist American soldiers than he ever was from the Germans. And let me just read to you what he wrote. The hate and scorn showered on us Negro officers by our fellow American white soldiers convinced me that there was no sense in dying for a world ruled by them. I avowed that if I got through the war, I would study law and would use my time on earth fighting for men who could not fight back. When he got out of the army, he entered Harvard Law School in 1920. As you can well imagine, there weren't many black students at Harvard Law School in 1920. He was the first black editor on the Harvard Law Review. That's how well he did in that arduous school at the time. And Felix Frankfurter, later to become Justice Frankfurter of the United States Supreme Court, described Charlie as one of the most brilliant students I have ever taught. He graduated cum laude in 1923 and set out to fight for equality for his race and in turn for all of us. He needed a cadre of black lawyers to take on the legal battles in the courts. So he went to work as a professor of law at Howard University near Washington, DC, a black university still today, uh, still today turning out fine students. And he worked there by 1929, he became the dean of Howard University Law School, and he began to gather the forces needed for the battle against Jim Crow and Plessy versus Ferguson. He used the law school to develop his theories to hone his ideas and to train lawyers to join him in this incredible adventure. Now, you may or may not know this, but her, his star pupil at the law school was none other than Thurgood Marshall himself. So he had quite a team. Now, he needed some money, he needed some support. So he turned to the NAACP, he became their special counsel, and they found ways to support this effort, because you can imagine there weren't many people who were interested in getting behind this. Charlie's strategy was pretty simple. He was going to start out by attacking segregated public schools, which he felt were the root of the problem. Attacking, segre attacking segregated public transportation and segregated housing. He decided to use the Equal Protection Clause, the law, and the 14th Amendment to, bet to uh, pursue that battle. Now, Charlie understood that the law works by precedent. A precedent is a case that has a holding that says this is the rule. Charlie knew that in order to topple a precedent of that standing, Plessy versus Ferguson, he was going to have to create his own precedents along the way. He couldn't start at the Supreme Court and just knock it over all at once. He understood that. He knows that the law grinds slowly and fine, so he started out to try to create precedents. In order to do this, he and his team, Thurgood Marshall and many others, looked around for targets that they thought would be useful in creating these precedents. And they picked plaintiffs who were unusually well suited for the job of taking on this task. His first case was in 1934, Donald Murray versus the state of Maryland. Murray was a well-qualified person to go to law school, except Maryland would not allow blacks in the state law school. So Murray, filed the case, uh, Murray and Charlie Houston filed this case, and they managed to win, and they got a fine opinion from the Intermediate Appellate Court in Maryland, granting the writ of mandamus, that said the Equal Protection Clause requires the state to permit this young black man to enter into the law school. Houston had his first precedent, and the game was on, Murray versus Maryland. The next case was Lloyd Gaines versus Missouri. Mr. Gaines wanted to go to law school in Missouri, and Missouri had a similar rule. No blacks allowed in the university system, much less the law school. But uni the university had a trick going up its sleeve. What it did was it, it would tell black students who applied, well, you can't go here to school at the university, but we will pay your tuition if you manage to get into law school in Kansas or Iowa, or Illinois, or Nebraska, state law schools that would allow blacks to study there. So they said, we'll pay your tuition, just get the hell out of the state. 
Well, as you can, as you can imagine, that went to court also. And uh, Charlie eventually won in the United States Supreme Court, seven to two, equal protection clause another precedent. But what's fascinating to me is that the United States Supreme Court used as a precedent to make its ruling in the Gaines case the decision of the intermediate appellate court in the state of Maryland. I am not aware of too many times that the Supreme Court has used a state intermediate decision to decide what the federal constitution means. But Charlie was able to pull that off, and it's right there. It's fascinating to read what the Supreme Court said about, uh, about the Murray case. Uh, by the way, Thurgood Marshall had been turned down by the University of Maryland Law School, so all of this is, was, uh, was just desserts. The next case involved a woman named Ida Lois Sipuel. She, too, wanted to go to law school, but Oklahoma denied her admission because of, of her race, and the Oklahoma Supreme Court Held the law, upheld the law school's decision. Well, that case was argued in the Supreme Court on January 8, 1948. January 8, four days later, the United States Supreme Court overturned the Oklahoma decision and permitted Ida Lewis Sipuel to go to law school at the, uh, at the university there. What was the precedent? The Gaines case. You can see how he was building building, building. This was all part of the technique and the strategy and the theory that he'd put together at Howard Law School. Now he had Gaines versus Missouri. The dominoes, one by one, were beginning to fall in the direction of Plessy and Jim Crow. The next case of significance was George McLaurin versus Oklahoma. George McLaurin had a master's degree in education, but he wanted to get a PhD so that he could teach his own people understanding the value of education. Well, Oklahoma simply wouldn't let a black in any higher university refused because of his race, so he went to court. The federal district court ruled in his favor, but the court gave Oklahoma time to comply with its ruling. So the Oklahoma legislature then changed the law and said, all right, we'll allow blacks to go to the institutions of higher learning. Not a problem. But feature this, they required Mr. McLaurin to sit in the hall outside of the classrooms in a chair listening to what was going on in the class through the open door. He was allowed in the library, but he could only sit at a special desk that was reserved for colored only. And he was not allowed to eat in the cafeteria at the same time that the white students were allowed to eat. Well, now this is bubbling up towards the Supreme Court, and I think the university must have started getting second thoughts about this because they sort of started changing things around. They said, okay, well, we'll let him in the classroom. And they did, but they put a railing around where he sat. They kind of blocked him off with a sign on it that said colored only. And they said, well, he can eat in the cafeteria, but only at a special table for colored only. All of these crazy kinds of things that they did to try to back this down a little bit. It really didn't work. In the Supreme Court, McLaurin won. And again, the precedents that the Supreme Court relied on were all the cases that Charlie Houston and his team were putting together. The other case in 1950 that's uh, quite interesting is Herman Sweat versus Painter. Who's Herman Sweat? A young black man who wanted to go to law school in the state of Texas. And Texas, too, would not permit blacks or colored people to enter into their law schools or their institutions of higher learning. Well, uh, Herman Sweat won in the lower court but the court gave Texas six months under Plessy versus Ferguson to come up with separate but equal facilities. Still going off of that separate but equal. And so what did the state of Texas do in order to have separate but equal facilities? The state of Texas created a whole new law school for Herman Sweat, <laughs> one student. They had a library, but they didn't have a librarian. They weren't accredited. They brought in some teachers. Well, the Supreme Court said, uh, too cute by a half. That doesn't work. So you had the Sweat case and you had the McLaurin case happening all at once. The unfortunate news is that Charlie was not there to see this. He died. His doctor said he literally worked himself to death and his heart gave out. 
The cases were argued, the McLaurin case and Sweat versus Painter in the Supreme Court, he died so he didn't see the decisions that came out a few days later, but they were all built on the foundation that he had created. But five cases, well, let me back up for a second. In both of these cases, Charlie and Thurgood Marshall and Bob Carter tried to get the Supreme Court to take Plessy on head on and just dump Plessy. The Supreme Court refused to do it. Courts tend to rule very narrowly on these kinds of issues, so all they would do is, well, we're only ruling on this case, we're only ruling on that case, and they said, but we're not going near Plessy. So that target was still out there. But five cases were in the pipeline, of course, one of which you know the name of is Brown versus Board of Education from Topeka, Kansas, but one of those five cases was, was also Bowling versus Sharp, which is a case that Charlie himself had filed in the District of Columbia. Uh, on, this, on the same theory. Well, you know the rest of the story. Brown versus Board of Education was decided by the Supreme Court. Plessy and Jim Crow were relegated to the trash pile, although it took a long time for those to play out in the real world. And I barely touched on the hundreds, the hundreds of cases that Charlie Houston and his team filed all over the United States, attacking restrictive covenants in schools and transportation. It was remarkable what he was able to uh, accomplish and I'm certain that his good work paved the way for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as well as the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Charlie's entire career, you talk about leaders for the transformation of society, exemplified the belief that the law could be used to promote fundamental social change and that the law was an instrument available to a minority even when that, when that minority was without access to the usual weapons of democracy. He said the black lawyer must be trained as a social engineer, and he taught students that a lawyer was either a social engineer or a parasite on society. <laughs> this is key to the law, which is who we are, why we are civilized. In the courtroom, he said, unlike in the public square, the majesty of the law could compel a white man to listen, and that reforms could be accomplished using the rule of law when blacks had no chance through politics. And that was true at the time. But he could use these concepts that our ancestors built into the Constitution and especially the Bill of Rights as our aspirations for the future, and he just kept reaching, reaching for that moon. Ironically, it took a dedicated black lawyer to bring Thomas Jefferson's vision, and indeed our vision for the nation, to fruition. Justice Douglas said, I knew Charlie Houston, and I sincerely believe he was one of the top 10 advocates to appear in the Supreme Court in my 35 years. Thurgood Marshall put it this way, we wouldn't have been any place if Charlie hadn't laid the groundwork for it. You have a large number of people who never heard of Charlie Houston, but you're going to hear a lot about him because he left us such important accomplishments. When Brown against the Board of Education was being argued in the Supreme Court, there were two dozen lawyers on the side of the Negroes fighting for their clients. Of those lawyers, only two hadn't been touched by Charlie Houston. That man was the engineer of it all. I can tell you this, if you do it legally, Charlie Houston made it possible. This is what I think Charlie Houston means to us. Charlie Houston exemplifies this concept of leaders for the transformation of society. We know where we've been, we know where we're going. There was another leader in Boise who did the same thing. His name was Alan Durr. Alan Durr took up the cause of women who'd been blocked out of the Equal Protection Clause. I won't go into the case, but Alan Durr and Ruth Bader Ginsburg took Reed versus Reed to the United States Supreme Court in 1971 out of Boise, Idaho, and the Supreme Court for the first time said, yes, women too are entitled to the equal protection of the law. So I hope you find Charlie as interesting as, as I do. And I think he, again, exemplifies and sets an example for all of us and shows us what we can do on behalf of our dreams if we just put our mind to it. And I thank Concordia for dedicating itself to that proposition. Thanks so much.
thank you very much. I am honored uh, tonight to be with you and to be honored uh, and recognized by Concordia University. Uh, first of all, uh, Chuck Schlimpert, thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership, most importantly, and what you've done for the city of Boise and the region. We really do appreciate the leadership of, of Concordia University. Dean Kathy Seilig, um, what else can I say? I mean, you've just done such a great job here as Dean. Uh, you've taken so many Boise State students, it's wonderful. We, <laughs> we, we love that, we love that. Um, but, uh, but your distinguished career uh, on the bench and in Idaho law, uh, you were without a doubt the perfect candidate for this position and uh, your leadership every day of the week shows through. Congratulations, uh, Steve. It's great that uh, here we are, wow, this is cool. Uh, Steve and I have a lot of opportunities to uh, share our thoughts and, and Steve's dedication to this community um, in many ways, but especially the Philharmonic has brought us together over recent years, and I, I really have enjoyed getting to know him. Uh, I'm sorry George White couldn't be here today. You saw his name uh, coming in. George is a neighbor of mine, and until two or three years ago, George walked his dog right past our house. And... Um, George, I didn't really know George. I didn't know who he was. I didn't understand that one day he'd have his name on Concordia University Law School. And uh, we would, we would uh, he'd stop in the, in the driveway uh, with his little doggie and, and he'd start asking me about the football team. And um, I'd answer a few questions and whatever. And, and then one day, I think it might have been when, when I, I met up with, uh, with Chuck Schlimpert and we talked about the university, there's George, and George obviously has played a key role in the success of this law school. I want to recognize, uh, by the way, I've been in, uh, in, in battle all day. Uh, we were at the, in the legislature today where I see Representative DeMorden laughing at that. Uh, he, knows, he knows the battles well, and there's Representative Moyle. He knows them too, and uh, Senator Widner's over here. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, um, the, today was an especially difficult day. And uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that the best move I ever made in trying to keep up with this fast-moving legislative session and everything that goes on uh, was the day that I asked Speaker Bruce Newcomb when he was stepping down as Speaker, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? I mean, your wife's going to be the Director of Agriculture. What, are you going to go home and be separated from her? So uh, Celia and Bruce have been great friends, and most importantly, Bruce has just done this incredible job of uh, helping us promote, explain, defend, whatever, support, whatever it is, uh, the work of Boise State University. It's great to have, great to have him here uh, tonight. Uh, one more I'd probably like to introduce, but I'm going to save that because she's part of the program. Now, I, I must tell you that I was really uh, impressed and, and somewhat taken back when I first heard about this award and, and that I was being chosen for it. Um, I really uh, don't consider myself the, the, the kind of person, at least if you look at the past and where I came from, uh, that would ever wind up getting something like this. And, and that's part of the story I really wanted to tell uh, beca because I have such great respect for the work of Concordia University. And I'm talking now not only about the law school, but uh, just as importantly, and as I will explain in a moment, what's going on over in Portland. And that is the, the proud history that Concordia Colleges across America, but especially in Portland and, and Chuck's leadership, have brought uh, to, this, to this country, a liberal arts education. By the way, I have a, I have a deal with, with Chuck. I think I can beat his 31 years, okay? <laughs> I, uh, I may have to work, I think I'm gonna have to work on this for a while. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, so, so I, I, this, this, this idea of a liberal arts education and what it means today, like in 2000, uh, you know, and, uh, and 14, to me is, is really important and something we really ought to think about. And what was great about it is that it's not too far away from my upbringing, so to speak, because I went to a small liberal arts college, uh, a different uh, piece of cloth, you might say, ran the place uh, than the Concordia family, uh, I went to a small Catholic college run by monks. And, and actually, uh, to the extent that I even call my liberal arts education a quality liberal arts education, which I think it was, it, it didn't really happen all at once. First of all, I just had this great senior high school teacher who just 
managed to impress upon every one of us the importance of learning across the board and across disciplines. And that experience was one that then took me into college. The only thing was, she was an English teacher, and she also taught me that the most homework were the folks that majored in English. <laughs> so I was smart enough to figure out early on that uh, political science had a lot less reading <laughs> than, than, than literature did. And so I decided to major in political science and here's the interesting thing, and I'm going to come all the way full circle with it. So uh, a few years after I'm out, and I get this PhD, and three PhDs in the same discipline, there's a really boring thing to do. And, and you get out, and you only know one thing in the world, and, and it included Plessy versus Ferguson, as a matter of fact. I don't know how many years I taught Plessy versus Ferguson. But I just felt like I was a bit inadequate, and I wound up at a school that was... A kind of a radical approach to education. They tore down all the departments and all the disciplines, and I'll get back to that too. And uh, they had me teach in a, in a program where I was in, a, in the classroom with two other guys. One was a marketing professor. And what I knew about the business major and about marketing, you could truly fit in a thimble. Because I, I stayed away from business. I was going to uh, go into the public service and run for office, and I didn't need any business to do that. Uh, a lot of people would say that, that you could prove that, but, any, <laughs> but anyway, no, uh, with, with present company excluded, of course, present company excluded. And uh, so anyway, uh, I get in the classroom with this marketing professor and this guy who teaches literature. And over the course of two small years, I was literally in my, I was in my mid to late 20s by then, transformed and realized that my learning had just begun. And I, I got a major in literature through that experience because Mike Lennon, who was the literature guy, uh, he's now the literary executor of Norman Mailer's literary estate, and he's just written the definitive biography of Norman Mailer. I don't know why you'd want to read that, but you're welcome to it. Uh, it's, it's about that long, and I never could figure out the guy. But Mike, in the meantime, I heard my whole life, all I heard was about Mailer, right? They were personal friends. But, but, but the good thing about Mike is that he really did teach me the value of the great, the great works and, and how the great works train and educate uh, and, and develop the mind. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And so now, this is where my partner comes in. Because here I am at this little school with these Benedictine monks teaching me. And by the way, it was only years later when I realized that Martin Luther was actually right. <laughs> you know, you'd never get that where I was, I want to tell you that. If you think the monks were talking that language, you're crazy, all right? But years later, I learned Boy, he had a lot of good points. You know, why, why didn't I think of that earlier? Uh, but in any event, uh, I meet up with Kathy. Kathy, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kathy goes to the University of Illinois, which, you know, you don't think about often enough, but she gets a, a liberal arts degree. She calls it speech communications. But her command of a number of disciplines across fields is, is amazing to me to this day. But here's the weird thing in these days of technical skills and business majors, everybody on our campus wants to major in business. She walks out of the University of Illinois with a bachelor's degree, never gets an advanced degree, never set foot in an MBA or whatever it is, winds up as director of the Illinois Department of Public Aid, $5 billion, but it was, it was a budget larger than the state of Idaho's budget when we moved here, uh, I remember that. 9,000 employees, she leaves that and runs Medicaid programs and then winds up consulting, gets to Kentucky where we lived, and she ends up getting hired by the governor to slash the Medicaid budget. She's doing this, she's bringing home all these numbers, and I don't understand these numbers, because remember, I'm the guy that did not major in business. But she didn't either, <laughs> all right? And somehow, some way, she becomes the numbers person of this family. We, we joke about the fact that if she gets run over by a car, I am really screwed, because there's no way. <laughs> I know that I, I don't have any information. I don't have any access to stuff. I don't know a thing. Uh, and so she balances the budget. But I'm still trying to figure out, how do you get so good at finance when you didn't have one finance course in your life? Well, I think the answer may be in an article 
that Thomas Friedman wrote a couple of weeks ago. He went out and, go and, and spent some time with the Google personnel guy. I can't think of his name. Bach, I think his name is. And, and he interviews this guy. What do you look for when you, when you hire people? And the guy says, uh, well, you know, we have a lot of requirements. I'll just give you one. He said, I want learning ability. I don't care about technical skills. We'll figure out how to deal with that when they get to us. He said, oh, we, need, we do need people that code. So there's a percentage of our workforce that we're, we're going to make sure we get good, good folks who can code. But beyond that, we want to train them. So we want people who are broadly educated. We want people who have, as I said earlier, this learning ability. He called it the, 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 the um, processing on the fly. I want somebody who can process on the fly. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it sounds pretty cool. And it's the kind of people I want to work alongside of. Uh, I, I know that. So, so now let's go to the here and now. And uh, I think I've made my case for the liberal arts, at least as far as Kathy and uh, I are concerned. I'm not sure about the rest. But uh, the, 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 and, and Representative Mordon has heard this. Uh, when I appeared before his committee, he's chair of the Education Committee in the House, uh, I, I listed the hot jobs on, on a PowerPoint, the Idaho hot jobs. And the Idaho hot jobs, every single last one of them, are in tech or they're in health science, or I mean, they're all health care of some kind, or tech, whatever else. And it's very impressive. Uh, so file that away for a moment. Now go, when you get home tonight, try this out. This is a kind of a cool little exercise. Uh, get your Google up on the screen and put in employers' concerns about skills of, gradu of college graduates. Okay? I've done this about, uh, I've, about a half dozen times in the last couple of weeks, especially when somebody told me that I wouldn't get the same results twice. And, and, and she was somebody who, who pretended to be some kind of a computer expert. And frankly, I'm getting the same results every time I do it, so, so much for that theory. But anyway, when you get the list, there, there's not a peep about a technical skill. The whole thing I mean, from U.S. News and World Report, a variety of employer magazines, a, vari a variety of employer, employer organizations. It's all about these kids have to get the soft skills. These kids absolutely have to get the soft skills. They have to be able to problem solve. They, have, they need critical thinking skills. I mean, you've heard the list because this is nothing necessarily new. But where, where are you going to get that? Well, you can go to Concordia or you can go to the little school I went to, uh, or you can go to a larger university and major in the right things and come out with this background. At Boise State, we have both an honors college uh, and, and we have some new program called, called our Foundational Studies Program, which is the reinvention of what we call the, the General Studies Program, and where what we're really trying to do is get students to think outside the box of this discipline that has produced those guys like Kustra who only knew this one thing by the time he was 25 years old, and that was political science, political science, political science. And instead, introduce our students at a very young age, when they're freshmen, to this incredible uh, array of disciplines and the way you bring them to together, the way you connect them. That's what foundational studies is all about. And I'm going to give you just one example. Uh, about four or five months ago, I went over to the College of Engineering to sit in on one of our 101 foundational studies program. Two faculty members. One, a PhD in material science engineering. Daryl Butt, who Mark Rudin has worked with uh, quite, quite a bit. Daryl is from the University of Florida, where he was a material science engineer. And he came to Boise State, which we thought was a great steal. And uh, the other faculty member, John Beter, the mayor's brother, who is a PhD in history from Boston University. These two guys are teaching a course together. Now, I, I must tell you, the course, by the way, is called Discovery and Invention in Western Civilization. And I might have the Western Civilization part wrong. But the reason I say Western Civilization is I sat in on this course for an hour. And about halfway through it, I thought, these guys are really clever. Because when I had Western Civ 101, fell asleep by 20 minutes into it. I had to memorize a lot of names, a lot of dates, and they were all gone in about a year, well, probably less than a year, right? After the final, anyway. 
Here was a course that spent the entire sweep of Western civilization talking about the inventors and the discoverers across the sweep of human history and examining the impact of one of those discoveries on another and examining the, live, the lives of each of those inventors and discoverers in the context of the times in which they lived, the cultures in which they lived, the economies in which they lived, the governments in which they lived. It was, a, it was philosophy, it was history, it was political science. And I shouldn't say was, because it's, it's going on right now. Those guys are teaching that right now. It is so exciting to work with a faculty who has figured it out. And what's interesting is that here, here I am at this ripe old age, and I'm thinking all the way back to that time when I wound up in the classroom with these other two folks, and I'm thinking, this is like deja vu all over again. Okay, but here we are doing it uh, at Boise State. And, and frankly, uh, I think we picked the program uh, from Brown University or somewhere. I mean, there's, there's certainly other places that are doing a lot, a lot more of this, but a complete refiguring of the common core. Now, um, back to the, the, the employer survey. Um, even though all those soft skills were mentioned, and even though I hope to have made some kind of a case for the liberal arts, uh, I must tell you that it was really discouraging to read the news that the North Carolina governor, in an attempt to cut the budget, decided some time ago, a few months ago, whenever it was, he made an announcement, we're just going to go right through all the universities, the public universities, and slash all the liberal arts schools because you know what? You can't get jobs in those areas. Now, I won't deny that there's some truth to that in some ways, and we as universities have the responsibility to help some of our liberal arts graduates get into the technical skills. And, and to come away with a combination of experiences that focus on that learning ability. But if they need to code, then we gotta figure out a way to give them some coding. If they need accounting, then we have to figure out a way to get them a couple of semesters of accounting in the midst of their history degree or whatever else it might be. And I guess that takes me to the, the, the final step in, in this, and that is that if you take a look at Arizona State University and Stanford where we you know, we, we, we try to steal good ideas from people who are a lot wealthier than we are, bigger than we are, and more reputable than we are, and those are two good ones right there. And so what we've done is take a good look at what they're doing, and uh, sometime this fall, well, it'll be in August, we will announce a new College of Design and Innovation. And the College of Design and Innovation, and, I, and I'm already talking to faculty who have literally, in a sense, gotten, they've gotten tired and worn out dealing in these very narrow disciplines and they're looking for an opportunity to jump out of their, their so-called home and spend more time with people in other disciplines and create new pathways to future careers. Well, this isn't exactly new thinking. Take a look at the January issue of, um, what's the name of that mag magazine, Kath? Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair. That's Kathy's magazine, by the way, okay? I mean, nothing, nothing, yeah, only on airplanes. So they have a great article about Yahoo's geek goddess. That wasn't Greek, Yahoo's geek goddess. Yahoo's geek goddess is Marissa Mayer. Marissa Mayer is all of, what, 42 years old or something? I mean, she's really incredible, and she's only been at Yahoo a few months. But somewhere buried in the middle of the article, they talk about her educational background. Her educational background is Stanford. Well, that, that makes sense. Her major, symbolic systems. Symbolic systems? Where are you going to find a major like symbolic systems? Well, you can find it at Stanford. As I said, they have a lot of money, right? And they can figure out a way to, to create all these things. What is symbolic systems? Well, it's linguistics, it's philosophy, it's computer science, and I'm missing one, and I regret that, but uh, it's, it's an amazing amalgam of those traditional disciplines that in 2014, on many college and universities and campuses, just aren't cutting it for our students anymore. And, and it, it, it forces them out. I mean, in fact, to some extent, you may have seen this, there's some new degrees called Master of Liberal Arts, where it's the flip, where you have technical people 
who were, who were well educated on the technical side, getting out of, of, of school, getting into jobs, and all of a sudden realizing that it's kind of tough to hold, on, hold a conversation in uh, cocktail parties where you're hanging out with one of these literature people or whoever they are. So they go back and they get a master's degree in liberal arts. To the same extent, I think we at the university, uh, as I said earlier, have uh, an obligation to work on the fact that uh, we have to provide some technical skills for those liberal arts graduates as well. Now, I'm going to give you one more layer of complexity, and then I'm finished. Uh, the, what I like about that clock, by the way, is that it doesn't move. So, <laughs> I, hey, I haven't even gotten, you got th this days, is, Bob. this is, yeah, this is a TED talk at 20, 15 minutes. I mean, I'm doing great right now, I'll tell you that right now. So. Uh, so anyway, here's, here's, here's the conclusion. There's a book that came out this last year called Generation on a Tightrope. And it's written, writ, written by Arthur Levine, who was the longtime dean of the, of the Columbia Teachers College. Uh, Arthur Levine, every, this is his third book. Like every 10 years, he does this book surveying 39 universities and colleges students within universities and colleges to come up with who they are. What do they look like? He did the, the Vietnam generation and then he did one in the 80s and, and, and he's, he's just finished this one. And it, no matter where you are in higher education, this is fascinating and I have to preface this by saying that what I'm gonna tell you now, he calls a composite, okay? Because I'm not charging any of our students with any of these traits that he suggests he learned in his survey of 39 colleges and university students. The first trait, well, it's about their parents. Their parents can't seem to let go. We live in an era when, oh, I don't know, I think there's some surveys out that show mom or dad is actually calling them three or four times a day. Uh, when, and this is, this is no joke. When, when we have moving in day here at Boise State, the idea is you move them in and then, okay, mom and dad, we'll see you uh, Thanksgiving. Well, at least that's the way it was for me. <laughs> now, we, we, we literally, during orientation, have to tell the parents that that's the day to go home, okay? You, you're, you're supposed to leave on move-in day. Not the day after, not the week after. You don't have to get an apartment here. They're gonna be fine. And that happens a lot, that really does, you know? So, so that's the first thing. How, how independent, uh, problem solving, thinking for yourself, decision-making skills can you be when you can't cut loose from mom or dad, and in some cases, by the way, it's not the kid's fault, it is mom and dad's fault. And go back to that Google employer survey deal, some of those are not just about critical thinking skills and problem solving skills, some of it actually nails this one and says the, I, I, the, these kids, first of all, they show up on the job the first day and think we owe them a living. You know, and, and, and of course, they all came from some kind of competition where there were absolutely no losers. Everybody gets a trophy these days, right? I mean, we know that for sure. Everybody gets a trophy. If, if, I, if, I, if, I was, if I had the time to be a coach in anything, I'd figure out, like, everybody gets three trophies and the rest of them don't. Not everybody. I mean, three people get trophies, the rest of them don't. You could tell I, we have grandchildren and everybody gets a trophy. Um, <laughs> So that's number one. Number two, a lot of these kids have come through some really tough times in the economy. Uh, their parents don't have the funding that they might have had in the 90s. And so in these days, uh, you might have a parent out of work. You might have a parent that lost his or her job. Uh, the money's not there, so they have to work more. So at the very time, we're thinking in these grandiose terms about how important it is to expose kids not just to their narrow discipline, but to these, to these other programs that are interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. These kids are like, hey, excuse me, I, I just got to figure out a way to get through here. That's a, great, that's a great challenge. The third one is what I call disruptive technology uh, innovation. And that's, that's the most interesting, and I'll bet you can figure this one out too. Uh, and, and this really happens everywhere you go on any campus. The minute class is over and they're walking down the quad, and I've done, needless to say, I walk a lot of quads. Everybody's like this, right? I mean, everybody's checking in with their friends and everybody's doing this. And you know what? They live in a virtual world that is really, they're in command of the virtual world. They know it. They know social media. They know all about it. Try to get them to take 
that social media world, that, that virtual world, and now connect in real life situations, and you, you've got some real challenges on your hands. And um, that's, what we're, that's what we're focusing on at Boise State right now, is how do we in our student affairs division deal with kids? And this is the way Levine sums it up. He said, I'm not saying these kids are any worse than previous generations, because if you take a look at his two previous books, he finds all kinds of challenges with them as well. But he says they're just different. It's the first generation that sees things differently. 9-11 happened on, on their watch. They were, they were kids on their, because this book is about two years old. So he was interviewing kids in 2008 and 9. So you know, these, these kids by then were middle schoolers when 9-11 when came along. So one of the questions they ask them is what's the most, what's the most important thing that happened in your lives? And the answer is the invention of the internet. And 9-11 comes in fourth, you know, and it's just a, a very different world. I, I'm not at all, I'm not that troubled by this. I think it presents a unique set of challenges for educators across universities and campuses in, in, in America. And as I said, uh, it's a composite, so it doesn't even apply to everybody. Kathy and I went to a scholarship dinner the other night that was literally run by our students. And it was the most impressive thing. Frankly, our staff couldn't have pulled it off as well as the students did. Okay, I mean, they were unbelievable. They were so good. And as I'm listening to each of them talk about who they were, there was a sophomore up there. There was a, a, a sophomore up there who was, who was who's in a lot, the light in the piazza, and she was singing. And, and there was another senior up there, and I'm thinking, wow, I, these, I don't know what I was doing when I was that age, but I know it isn't half of what they're doing, you know? And, and so... It's, it strikes me that even though it's a composite, there are lessons for us all to learn and some great, uh, great challenges uh, that lie ahead. Uh, but the most important message is that education is not for the narrow-minded. Education is not for those who dig down so deep into one area that they wind up forgetting about this incredible world in which we live, this incredible history that we have before us, and the opportunities to delve into all aspects of that, the, the, the opportunities to, to look at science and discovery uh, through, through the lens of a historian and a material science engineer. Wow, that's what it's all about. Once again, uh, I think it all starts with that Liberal Arts Foundation. And again, uh, if you haven't had a chance, go on to the, to the website of Concordia University in Portland, and um, you're, you're going to see some, some great work that Concordia does. And uh, Chuck, as I said earlier, it just brought me back to my roots, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for this opportunity to be recognized by you and to share uh, a common theme and purpose. Thank you.